All right, what is cracking healthiest social media family in the game? We are headed outside for an afternoon slash light evening run. Let's get the let's get the lint off this old shirt. Let's also find a will to find a way to ask Herbert to be here tomorrow and every damn day after that. So this is a very special run. It's a it's a commemorative run. It's it's a run filled with joy because this run, jog, light run, jog, is gonna be the run I tell the story of how I met my lovely wife, Margaret Hines. How exciting is that? Okay guys, okay guys, we are here in the hot Atlanta, Georgia, and it is time to get it in where I can put it in. Three, two, one, light jogging. Feeling good, wearing those Project Rock headphones. You're damn right I am. Why wouldn't I be? They're the best in the game. All right, wearing those Project Rock US DNA. Come on, you gotta get right in there. You see that all for yourself. Let's, they just came in the mail yesterday. The black pair already have the white pair. Okay, I'm digressing, I have to focus. I only have roughly 23 minutes to do this, so. Let's get it on and pop it. John, Margaret, Seldron. Whew, what a name, huh? Got that French first name, J-E-A-N-N-E. -N -N -E. She walked into my life at a time when I was in all kinds of pain. She walked into my life at a time when everything was going wrong in South. And she changed everything. I love you, honey. We've had our ups and downs. And so does every married couple in the world. You've given me more ups and more strength and courage than anyone I know. You've given me this light at the end of the tunnel. Let's talk about the day we met, the day you walked into my life and changed it forever. Oh, good Lord. What a fucking story. It's, it's the love story. Pure love, baby. Pure love. All right, so. Let's just get, get into it. I was in my third of eight psych ward stays. Third of eight psych ward stays. And I was in a world of hurt. I was well overweight, near diabetic, and in a great deal of lethal emotional pain, and extremely suicidal. And I, uh, I end up in the ward for two months, which was my longest stay at the time. Two months. May 1 to June 25th, locked down in floor number three, in the third wing of the psychiatric unit. It was terrible. It was miserable. In the first three days of being in this unit, I got an altercation with two of the nurses, a brawl, a fight between two nurses, three orderlies, and two security guards and me so six or seven people going at it with the nurses trying to stick me with Haldol to put me to sleep and the security guards trying to take me to the ground to put me under and people got hit it was it was really but I ended up going to sleep that day easy with that shot in my rear held all. They had to do what they had to do and I don't blame them. They had to handle the business because I was out of control. That was day one of entry, May 1st into that psych unit, day one. So I end up 
getting a little better and getting a visit from my Uncle George on my mom's side. My favorite uncle on my mom's side. And Uncle George was the fun uncle. He was the uncle that would make everybody laugh. Uncle George had a superpower. He could meet you, and within five minutes of meeting you, he would offend you, not sensibly. He would offend you to your core. It was like he was a supervillain of offense. He was good at it. He had a skill that mastered over time. And Uncle George was the only one, the only one too, to come. Him and Uncle Kevin Joseph Ryan were the only two to come to every psych horse day, every time, without fail, no matter what. And Uncle George, he would, he would drive in from six hours away from Arnold, California. He would drive in from six hours away from Arnold, California to see me in one of my psych horse days. He wasn't laughing this time. This is the third time I was in a lockdown unit. He wasn't smiling, he wasn't making jokes. He was very serious. He looked at me in the eye with a rolled up magazine in his left hand. And he said, Kevin, your family can help you until we are blue in the face. But until and when, young man, you take 110% responsibility for the fact that you have bipolar disorder and you fight it tooth and nail every day, he said, kid, ain't nothing gonna change. You'll be in and out of these lockdown units for the rest of your life. Is that what you want? And I said, no, Uncle George, that's not what I want. He said, well, kid, you better get it together. And he dropped the Time Magazine article on the table like a mic drop, and he got up and he left. I was so pissed off. I didn't see his perspective. I picked up the Time Magazine article, and the cover was about fighting bipolar disorder, depression, and mental illness with routine and regimen and winning the fight. And uh, it was Time Magazine 2004. It was the month of May. When he got to the door, he passed a 67-year-old Spanish woman named Gloria, who was arguably gonna be in this ward for the rest of her life or something like it. There was no getting Gloria back from the brink of her insanity. She was gone. It was sad for her. And, uh, and uh, I said, I read, I read the article through and through after Uncle George was passing this woman and said, do you want to be like this, Kevin? I said, no, Uncle George. He said, well, get it together, kid. We're counting on you. He said, get it together, kid. We're counting on you. And he left. And that's when it happened. I had a breakthrough in that psych unit. I had a breakthrough. I realized I had to fight for my mental well-being. I realized I had to have a purpose so I could succeed. I realized I had to put in the work, hustle hard or go home. And uh, so in that psych ward, I read that article through and through twice, how to balance your brain health with regimen and routine. I started exercising three times a day, 23 minute increments every day. 23 minutes of rigorous exercise, at least 12 hours of better mood, better brain health. I started to sleep better. I was an insomniac. I wasn't sleeping at all, causing psychosis, plus the bipolar disorder. I started to use sleep meditation music. Music that has the power to change brain waves and brain patterns to affect sleep function. When I did that, I was sleeping better and I was feeling great. Sleep is crucial to mental well-being. I go to the nurse's station and I ask the nurse, for, I asked the nurse if I could use their gym facilities. And she said, son, this is a psych ward. I said, every psych ward should have a gym. It's in the magazine. I did everything I could to feed my brain, to change my brain, to feel better mentally, to stabilize, and to get well so I get the fuck out of that ward that I would keep finding myself in. And it would lay the groundwork for changing my life and for meeting Margaret. In that ward, in that ward, eating better, 
non-inflammatory foods, healing my gut to heal my mind. I'm exercising multiple times a day to, to use movement, because I'm physically capable and I'm lucky I have it. Use movement to change my brain and to change my mood. I'm now reading every publication I can about this disease they say I have, bipolar disorder. And I still read every publication that comes out. I got a Google alert on bipolar disorder type one with psychotic features so I can always defeat that shit. And so I can learn the best tools in the game to change my brain, my behavioral and spiritual well-being. I'm doing it in that war and I'm getting it done for the first time in a long time. I'm rocking it. I'm feeling great. I'm getting mentally well for the first time in the better part of, well, it had been 2004 or so, in the better part of five, six, no, since 17 and a half my diagnosis, better part of six, seven years, I'm finally starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel. And that's when it all went down. In rolls in a kid, 19 years of age on a gurney. He's catatonic. He can't walk and he can't move. He's immobile, but not because he was paralyzed, because of his brain. His brain just stopped functioning. He had been using illicit drugs since he was 13. Hardcore street drugs. Uh, even dabbled in heroin. And he was in a world of pain on methamphetamines and other drugs. Speed, I think it was. But this kid was so special. Every single day without fail, somewhere between 15 and 22 individuals would come to see this young man. The unconditional love they showed him was remarkable. Remarkable. But he was kind of tonic. He couldn't move and he couldn't talk. So, even though none of the nursing staff, none of the hospital staff would engage with this young man more than moving him around in his wheelchair, or when he was able to even stand and briefly stubble forward, helping him with his elbows, and so he wouldn't fall. I sat with this young man breakfast, lunch, and dinner because I knew if I could talk to him, if I could give him words of wisdom, if I could tell him stories, which Uncle Kevin Joseph Ryan taught me how to do the 10 years I went to his AA chips. He was 30 years drunk, 30 years sober. I went through the last 10 years of those 30 years of chips. Uncle Kevin, may he rest in peace. I sat with this kid, Eddie, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I told him story after story after story after story, hoping, wishing, and praying that I would elicit a response. And one day, this is what he does. He goes like this in his, in his wheelchair, in, in his wheelchair at the cafe. He and I alone at the table. He goes like this. Jeez, man, you talk too much. Leave me alone. Breakthrough. I jumped up and did a happy dance. I was so thrilled. I was so ecstatic. I was so happy. I had elicited a response from this kid and it was next level magical. People were clapping in the background. All right, it was just a lady who was always clapping, but she meant it for me. The kid wanted nothing to do with me after that. He's like, can you just leave me be, please? Enough with the stories. But the next day, when his family came and he was upright and vertical and they put their hands on the wire glass and he put his hand on the other side, that too was magical. And I saw the light in their eyes when they saw their Eddie was back, at least in the semblance of the, of the word. Now I had gone up to the nursing station a few days before and I found the case manager, I think her, I'm not gonna say her name. She was from Brooklyn, tough lady. I said, listen, give me a job. She said, what now? I said, you got me on. You got me on all these forms of therapy. Give me a job, give me something productive to do. And instead of 10 forms of therapy, give me five and give me some work. I gotta be productive. I feel, I feel useless in here. She said, you're telling me you want to volunteer for the psych ward you're staying. And I said, yes. She said, no, that's highly unethical, probably illegal. That's not going to happen, Kevin. I said, well, can I at least have a hug? She said, what? I said, 23 second hugs release oxytocin in the brain that make you feel better. It's in the magazine. But then the next day she went on vacation and the new case manager comes in 
And this lady was like putty in my hands. She was a certified 1960s San Franciscan. She was a hippie through and through, salt and pepper hair out to here, curly fried and hued, lay of flowers around her neck. She would hand pick from her garden that morning, a flower in her right ear. She wore tie-dye shirts every day that she claimed were different. It was the same damn shirt. And, and I go to her and I say, give me a job. And she says, that sounds like a lovely idea. What can we have you do? <laughs> And she goes back and she grabs a giant green binder amongst 22 other giant green binders. And she says, I know, you can file these. And I said, well, what are they? And she said, patient binders. Have you ever heard of HIPAA privacy laws? You can't do that. That's illegal. And she said, just do it alphabetically and don't look at the details. I did it alphabetically. And I promise you, I did not look at most of those details. I finished that job, get my next job. Clean out the giveaway clothes closet. When you leave the hospital, you got something to wear. You know, we're all wearing hospital gowns, hospital pants, hospital slippers with grips on the bottom, not me. So what do I do? What do you think I did? I came out of the closet with a Ralph Lauren double-breasted polo suit and a 70s yellow flared collar like some kind of gangster who owned the place. And I walk up to the nurse's psych ward station and I grab a notebook, a clipboard, and a pen. I five finger discounted it. I grab that notebook, clipboard, and pen. I take it, and I'm doing official hospital documentation. Leonardo the Ninja Turtle is looking solid. And that's when it happened. In walks Patrick, Kevin, pragmatic, pessimistic, stone-faced Pat Hines, my father, who's wearing a suit because he's a businessman, and I'm a, a total fraud in a psych ward. And he has no peripheral vision, and he says to this poor lady, excuse me, I'd like to see my son Kevin, please. And she says, mm-hmm, and points at me. He looks at me and does a double take. And he goes, Kevin, what the hell are you doing? Which was one of his mantras, by the way. I said, no. I said, Dad, I work here now. And he freaked out. He goes, what, what? He looked at this poor lady. He said, get me the manager. And she looks at him and she says, sir, this is not a hotel. And he said, get me the head nurse now. And she looks at him and she was the head nurse. They started going at it. It was getting wild. I had to shut it down. I said, that's it. No more Pat Hines. I had no idea they would then forcibly remove my father from the psych ward with orderlies and security. It was a scene. He kept it quiet. He, you know, he's a third degree black belt in judo. He could have dismantled them with his fucking pinky toe, but he kept it quiet. It was, he calmed it down and he left he left not to make a larger scene. The very next day, the very next day, I'm at the nurse's psych ward station with my pink polo shirt, my khaki cargo shorts, and my sandals from the giveaway clothes closet. Brand new out the box, they fit me like a glove. And I go up to the nurse's station with my clipboard, notebook, and pen. Leonardo the Ninja Turtle is finished. I pick up the afternoon announcement PA system device, which was like a old school mic from a boxing ring and I make a rhyming announcement about visiting hours. And that is when my life changed forever. I, I get a tap on my left shoulder and I, I turn around and there she was. Her eyes were almond brown, sexy and cool, and I was done. I never knew anything more in my entire life, but I knew at that millisecond that she would be the rest of my life. I looked at Margaret, she looked at me, and she said, excuse me, do you work here? And I looked at the entire staff. The entire staff was at the nurse's station. And I looked at them and they looked at me like, what is this little turd going to say? And I looked at them like, you best be quiet or we'll all have a conversation about the binders. And they didn't say anything. And I said, as a matter of fact, miss, I am a volunteer. And she said, I'm looking for my cousin. His name is Eddie. Do you know which room is his? And I said, Madam, right this way. I put my hand on the small of her back and the other one on her elbow, and I walked her to the nurse's psych ward station like this, which she later claimed was just plain creepy with a capital K. But I get her to the room, the kid sees me, I duck out into the hallway and I hear her say, your nursing staff is so nice. And that's when he says, that guy? That guy is a nutball. Don't talk to that guy. That guy jumps off bridges. And I ran in there and I said, excuse me. It was one. It was one bridge, plural. That's ridiculous.
She comes out of the room. She says, why'd you lie to me? Let's finish this run. I'm standing too, too solid. Here we go. So she says, why'd you lie to me? I said, Margaret, I didn't lie to you. I am a volunteer at this hospital. I just happen to also live here. <laughs> it was fantastic. It was amazing. You should have seen the look on her face. Anyway, right before the kid's about to get out of the hospital, Margaret comes in one last time. I stop her short at the door. I said, Margaret, when I get out of here, could I take you to coffee? And she looks at me and she leans in and she says, oh honey, hell no. I was, I was crushed. My heart was broken, but I wasn't done. Persistence is the key with love, mental health, and psych wards. So I end up going after it pretty hard and I end up stealing her number from her cousin's phone in the cubby hole of the psych ward because you know I worked there. There was no phone thumb pass. There was no eye retina scan. I got her number and I got out of there. Now I did my 30 days probationary period at the psych ward station. 30 days of following the rules to a T or they kick you out so fast your head will spin. So my 30 days are up. I get my first weekend off. Who do you think I call? That's right, you're darn right. I called Margaret Hines. Well, she wasn't Margaret Hines then. I called Margaret Seldra. This is how the phone call went. Hi, Margaret. It's Kevin. Kevin? Kevin who? I said, Kevin Hines. She said, um, I don't. I said, from the psych ward. She says, Kevin, hi. How are you? Um, how did you get this phone number? <laughs> I said, Mark, that is unimportant. It's Friday. Can I take you to dinner? And she said, oh, Kevin, I don't, you know, I just, I stopped her. I said, listen, Margaret, I need this. I need just one day. If you don't like it, if it goes south, you'd never have to see me again. And so she goes, oh, God, fine. Meet me at, meet me at 850 at my house around that time. So I show up at Margaret's apartment, but I made a big mistake, a big mistake. I showed up at Margaret's apartment with a giant ski duffel bag of lots of my things. <laughs> and she looks at me, she goes, what is that? I said, Margaret, it's a funny story. When you leave the halfway home on a Friday and you go out past 9 p.m., you kind of can't come back to the halfway home until Monday. <laughs> she goes, oh, hell no. <laughs> it was a risk. I was willing to sleep on the street, but I had to go on that date with that beautiful woman that would become my wife. So I knew it day one. She just had, she, she didn't see the vision yet. So, what ends up happening is we go on the date to a restaurant called Cafe Sport in San Francisco, California. And you don't order at Cafe Sport. They look at you, they judge you, and they order for you. You best not have allergies. I have lots of allergies. This guy comes over, all right? We're elbow to elbow, okay? You can hear everybody's conversation in a restaurant verbatim. It's an old mob hangout, by the way. That's no joke, Cafe Sport's a serious place. They ordered Margaret an eggplant Parmesan dish. Simple, quaint, clean, fit on the table. But they put on my side of the table a giant bed of spaghetti, a mountain of marinara sauce, a huge uncracked lobster, a votive with a candle, a plate and boiling butter, like that, and an oddly cut lemon wedge, like on purpose. And I'm thinking, this jackass doesn't like me at all. And I have allergies, and I've never cracked a lobster in my life. And, not to mention, I was living in a halfway home on $3 a fucking day, all right? $3 a day. That meant I could buy myself a Tully's coffee, or I could get myself maybe half a bagel at Noah's if Pete was nice to me, all right? So, I'm freaking out because this jack-off orders the most expensive thing on the menu, right? And uh, I take the cracker, I place it on the tail, 
I cried. Marinara sauce all over. My only good white shirt. About as big as Herbert the Sea Lion was. It was my only good white shirt. I just bought it at Old Navy on the clearance rack on sale for five dollars which by the way is a two-day shirt so I'm freaking out and I'm thinking she's gonna think I'm a slob in the first five minutes of this day but my brain reacts Kevin do something classy right now so I said but what does that mean Kevin and I said I don't know figure it out man I got this inner dialogue going and my mind snapped I picked up the lemon wedge I looked at Amara's almond brown, sexy, cool eyes. I started to shake. And I squoze that lemon as hard as a lemon has ever been squozing. That's right, that's a word in the English dictionary. Look that up, but don't do it right now. And I, I squoze it so hard, I missed her plate and mine. And I watched a stream of lemon juice fly directly into her left eye. She screams. The woman next to us decides to get involved. Myth, are you okay? I said, hey, Smoker 67, it's a date. It's going south. You're not helping. I said, Mario, I'm so sorry. But then my brain reacted again. Kevin, do something classier right now. What does that mean, Kevin? I have no idea, Kevin. Figure it out, buddy. And I go as hard and fast as I can for the plate of boiling butter. Oh, shit. I tipped the plate. I watched this two droplets of boiling butter fly across that tiny table between her blouse onto her chest and they burn Margaret. And she screams bloody murder. The entire restaurant stopped cold. This could not get worse. Well, I'm a gentleman. Yes, I am. My father taught me to be one. So did Debbie Hines. I grabbed my napkin. I grab my napkin and I reach over. And now I'm doing this on a first date right here. Holy hell, it just got worse, a lot worse. She looks down and she says, hold on, I gotta make this light. She looks down and she says, what are you doing? And I said, I don't know. I have no idea what I'm doing. And she says, the only two words on a first date you do not want to hear when you haven't eaten your food. Check, please. It's over. It is over. We're not getting married. We're not gonna have the dog named Max. All those wrinkles look just like that. We walk back to her apartment. She opens the door. She sees the bag of all my stuff. She turns around and she says, Kevin, we're going to the roof. I said, Mari, are you going to throw me off? She says, no, Kevin, come on. We go to the roof, two yoga mats and a box garden. We lay down. We face each other. Awkward silence. I turned to Mari. I said, Mari, what in the hell are we doing here? She said, Kevin, if all we do right now is stare at that full moon, ain't nothing else can go wrong. Yes, champion of dating. Hell yeah. And here's what happened next. Hell yeah. I waited patiently. I waited oh so patiently to tell Miss Margaret how I felt about her. I waited all the way until we were on our second date to let her know. And I loved her. It happened like this. We're in the car, on the road, to go to see our first concert together, which would have been my first concert ever. I know, awkward, right? We go to see Most Def in concert. He didn't show up, by the way. Thanks, Most. I still love you. You make great films. Anyway, and you're one hell of a lyricist. He's not one of the best. And so, and so, we're 
on the road, on our way to our second day. I'm bursting at the seams. I, am, I, can, I can barely contain myself. She's driving. I turn to Mara. Mara, I have to tell you something. It's crucial, I have to tell you right now. Something. She said, what, Kevin, what's going on? I'm driving, you're making me nervous. I said, Mara, she said, Kevin, what is it? Just tell me. I said, Margaret, I love you. And this is what she did. <laughs> um, thank you. Nonetheless, you all know the end of the story. She's my very best friend. She's the light that brightens my life every day. She's the gift that keeps on giving. We, just like every married couple, have our tough times. But she is the best thing that has ever and maybe even will ever happen to me. And I'm grateful for every single millisecond I get to awaken next to her, hold her in my arms, and tell her I love her. And I'm gonna go run 30 minutes just to get back into those beautiful loving arms of Margaret Seldron Hines. Guys, that's the vlog. All right, you heard it here first. The whole story of how I met my beautiful and loving wife. What's gonna be next is a reaction video of her reacting to all of this to see if it all matches up. YouTube.com slash Kevin Hines. Hit subscribe and click that friggin' bell. And stop once in a while to smell the roses. And breathe. Jeff Levin says breathe. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift. That is why we call it the present. To all of you in pain, remember, you can die anytime. We're all gonna die someday. Fight to live, so someday you can change for the better. Sign our guys, and always, Find a way through the pain. To be here tomorrow, and every damn day after that. Holla at your boy.